by considering a checkerboard of some arbitrary size and a checker which can move up, left, down, and right, but not diagonally. So here's one question that we can ask. Is there a tour of the checkerboard? So can we move the checker in some path so it visits every cell in the checkerboard exactly once and then returns to the cell in which it started? Here's an example of a tour of the 8x8 eight eight checkerboard. Now, another term for a tour is a Hamiltonian cycle. And if a checkerboard has a Hamiltonian cycle, then we can also say that the checkerboard is Hamiltonian. So this means that the 8x8 checkerboard is Hamiltonian. But for example, the 7x7 checkerboard turns out to be not Hamiltonian. The 7x5 checkerboard is not Hamiltonian either. In general, it's relatively simple to see that aside from trivial cases when n or m is 1, an n by m checkerboard is Hamiltonian if and only if either n or m or both of them are even. Now let's consider a similar but slightly more complicated problem. Suppose our checker can only move up and right, but we're on a special checkerboard. We're on the wraparound checkerboard. So whenever the checker falls off the right edge, it gets placed back on the left edge in the same row. Whenever it falls off the top edge, it gets placed back on the bottom edge in the same column. So we can ask the same question. For what sizes of wraparound checkerboards is the checkerboard Hamiltonian? Uh, here's an example of how the checker might move. It might hit the right boundary, return to the left boundary, hit the top boundary, return from the bottom, hit the right boundary again, return to the left, and then return to where it started. So this is not a Hamiltonian cycle because it does not visit every cell of the checkerboard exactly once. But it is a feasible path for the checker to travel in. Now, this problem has been solved, which of these are Hamiltonian. So Trotter and Erdos showed that a wraparound checkerboard of size n by m is Hamiltonian given certain conditions about the greatest common divisor of n and m. OK, so how does this relate to our problem? Well, we're considering a similar checkerboard. And to show how it's similar, we need to make the observation that the wraparound checkerboard is, in fact, a checkerboard on a torus. So why is this? Well, let's look at how we wrap edges around in that checkerboard. The right boundary is wrapped down to the left. So when the checker falls off the right boundary, it returns on the left side. This means that effectively, the right boundary is the same as the left boundary. And so we can glue those two boundaries together. We label them B and B prime. The two arrows there are both pointing down. The fact that they're pointing in the same direction, all that means is that when the checker falls off the right edge, it stays in the same row. So we're not twisting the edges around before gluing them. We just glue them together. And we get a cylinder. And we can do the same thing for the top and bottom boundaries. A and A prime, the arrows are pointing in the same direction. And we can glue them together to get a torus, as we expected. The red circle there is the boundary between A and A prime. The blue circle is the boundary between B and B prime. All right. So now we've shown that we can construct a torus checkerboard by wrapping the edges of a checkerboard in a certain way. A natural question to ask now is what about two-hole torus checkerboards? So is there a way to wrap the edges of a rectangular checkerboard so that it forms the shape of a two-hole torus? And the answer is yes. We need to divide the checkerboard into four quadrants. So there are eight segments on the boundary now. Uh, the two on the top, A and B, are equal. A prime, B prime equal, and so on. And then we glue A to A prime, B to B prime, and so forth. So now if we glue A to A prime and C to C prime, you can see with a bit of effort, I guess, that you get a torus with a square cut out of it. And then if you glue B to B prime, you get a torus with two disks cut out of it, which are bounded by D and D prime. Then you glue D and D prime together, and you get a two-hole torus as we expected. So in this manner, we can create a two-hole torus checkerboard. We start with our checkerboard, cut it into quadrants. And then whenever a checker falls off edge A, it returns to A prime. Whenever it falls off edge B, it returns to B prime, and so forth. And here are some example edges. And now we call this a two by three checkerboard, even though it has four rows and six columns, because the size of each quadrant is two by three. And that's, in some sense, the unit size of the checkerboard. Right, here's an example of how a checker might move on the checkerboard. So it hits boundary C in the top cell. It returns by boundary C prime in the top cell. It hits the bottom cell of boundary C. 
it returns to the bottom cell of boundary C prime. It hits the bottom cell of boundary D, returns to the bottom cell of boundary D prime, and now, oops, we're stuck. So this is not a Hamiltonian cycle, because it didn't, didn't visit every cell, and it did not return to where it started. But this does not mean that the two by three two-hole torus checkerboard is not Hamiltonian. It just means that we haven't shown that it is yet. So that's our question. What sizes of two-hole torus checkerboards are Hamiltonian? Here is an algorithm to figure for a given checkerboard if it's Hamiltonian. Notice that in a Hamiltonian cycle, we visit every cell exactly once. So we can assign to each cell a direction, either up or right, indicating that the cell after the, cell, the particular cell in the Hamiltonian cycle is either above or to the right. So the, it's the direction that the checker moves out of that cell. And then once we pick a direction for every cell, then we can start our checker at some arbitrary location and follow the directions like a roadmap and see if that traces out a Hamiltonian cycle. If it does, our checkerboard's Hamiltonian. If it doesn't, we have to pick a new set of directions and repeat. But there are four NM cells, and there are two ways to choose a direction for each of them. So we get an algorithm that for a 10 by 10 grid will take 10 to the 106 years, approximately, if you have a pretty fast computer. And I don't think I want to wait this long. So let's try to make a faster algorithm. Consider two diagonally adjacent cells, like the ones in red there. For each of them, we can pick two directions. Suppose that the directions we pick for them are different. If we pick the inner directions highlighted in red, then that cell they're both pointing to gets visited two times in the Hamiltonian cycle. And this is bad, because a Hamiltonian cycle can only visit each cell exactly once. If we pick the outer two edges, then that cell there gets visited zero times, because neither of the edges to it are in the Hamiltonian cycle. So this means that the diagonally adjacent cells must have the same direction. They're both up or they're both right. And now we can divide our grid into diagonals. So a diagonal just consists of moving right and down, right and down, right and down, diagonally, one diagonal. And every cell in this diagonal must have the same direction for it to possibly be a Hamiltonian cycle. This means instead of iterating over all the directions for all possible cells, all four NM cells, we only have to iterate over all the directions for all diagonals. And there are fewer of those, only four times the greatest common divisor of NM diagonals in an n by m two-hole torus checkerboard. So this gives us an algorithm that for the 10 by 10 two-hole torus checkerboard, it will complete in three days. This is a lot better. Now let me pre present some of the more important results that we've come up with. Uh, so if an n by m two-hole torus checkerboard has one diagonal, unless it has a trivial size, it is not Hamiltonian. This is because if there's only one diagonal, then all the cells must have the same direction. But then we can only visit at most two rows or at most two columns in the checkerboard. That's why the dimensions have to be small. Uh, second proposition. If we scale a two-hole torus checkerboard by some factor g, then the number of diagonals also scales by that same factor g. And this is what we would intuitively expect. So it's nice to see that it's actually true. Uh, we've classified all two by n two-hole torus checkerboards. We know which of them are Hamiltonian and which are not. And we could construct similar proofs for a three by n and four by n cases, but they get progressively more complicated. And for five by n, it completely breaks down. And here, we've shown that there's a periodicity to which ones are Hamiltonian. So if we add 12 times the number of rows to the number of columns in our checkerboard, then the larger checkerboard is Hamiltonian if and only if the smaller one is. OK, back to some algorithmic results. We found a pseudo-polynomial time algorithm to determine if a given checkerboard is Hamiltonian. So this means that it's polynomial in the values n and m. And so for a 10 by 10 checkerboard, it will take 40 microseconds to give you an answer. That's a lot better than 10 to the 106 years and even than three days. And we have a polynomial time alg algorithm to determine the number of diagonals in a given checkerboard. So polynomial time means that it's polynomial in the length of our input, in the number of digits required to write down n and m. So that will finish in under a second for pretty much any imaginable input. In the future, it would be interesting to see a polynomial time algorithm for determining which checkerboards are Hamiltonian. The fact that we have a polynomial time algorithm for finding the number of diagonals suggests that this might be possible because they are closely related problems. Furthermore, 
it would be interesting to see if we can extend these results to three-hole torus checkerboards, four-hole torus checkerboards, and so forth. OK, I'd like to thank my mentor, Chi Hyun Kim, for helping me with this project pretty much every day of the past five weeks. I'd like to thank the MIT Math Department faculty, Dr. Tanya Kovanova, Professor Ankur Moitra, Professor David Jarrison, and Dr. Slava Gerovich for helping with every step of this process. I'd like to thank my tutor, Dr. Jenny Sendova, for giving feedback on the paper and on the presentation. I'd like to thank my sponsors, and I'd like to thank CE, RSI, and MIT for giving me this opportunity. Thanks very much. Questions from the judges? So I have, I think, a dumb question. Can we go back to where uh, you can't have things on a diagonal going different directions? So I think I understand why they, why they can't just point right into each other. But why can't they be pointing away from each other? Why is so that not allowed? The cell which is adjacent to both of them can only be reached from these two cells in red. Oh, it would get abandoned. OK, thank yes. you very much. I think I just missed that. The question's from the judges. Yes. Can you take a mic? Uh, speaking of dumb questions, <laughs> um, there is so-called search problem. You are inspecting us in a sense surface, looking in different uh, different parts of the surface. In your case, it's uh, similar to looking at different uh, little pieces. And you want to find if there is your search object as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. For that, you definitely don't want to visit the same spot twice, because you waste time. So now uh, the question. Do you think uh, some of your algorithms can be you modified to optimize that search problem, which is a big problem for a variety of applications? So it's possible, but I'm afraid it's not particularly likely it can be generalized too much. Because, for example, we cannot at this point even generalize to the case when the quadrants are of different sizes. So well, actually, forget quadrants. If we, right now we're dividing each edge in half and then gluing diametrically opposite edges. Mm -hmm. So our algorithm uh, requires the fact that A and A prime uh, have the same length as B and B prime. So we I can't. probably misspoke. I'm not saying using your exactly algorithm. Mm -hmm. Use same line of thinking to find new, better search algorithms. And actually, that is less of the question, more of the statement. What I would uh, say, I would encourage you to look at that application and see if you come up with some novel, better search algorithms. Okay. And you might also look at very old, uh, prob old uh, branch of polymer theory or probability theory, which was called theory of self-avoiding random walks, which might also give you some analogy and inspire to do something. I see. Th thank you. Thank very you. nice presentation. Thank you. Yes, Adam. The um, pseudo-polynomial time algorithm that you have. That, that's neither of the algorithms you talked about, right? Yes. So c can you give um, some high level idea of what it does how, or how it works? Sure. So I stated that there are f at most four times the greatest common divisor diagonals. And so this is only slow when the greatest common divisor is very large. So when suppose greatest common divisor is g, then we have at most four g diagonals. And it turns out that we can group our diagonals into sets of size g. So we don't need to actually consider all two to the g ways of orienting the g different diagonals in one group. There's actually only g plus 1 ways that we need to consider. That's how we get the speed up. Because those g diagonals look almost exactly the same, just shifted. Any further questions from the judges? Any audience questions? Yes, sir. In your future work, you showed uh, uh, three holes. Of course. Uh, in the two hole, you 
said it was a two by three block. Do you know what the blocking is for three? And there's more than one topology that three could come up. You have three linearly, as you showed, or it could be three in a triangle. Is there a folding pattern for the triangle as well? Okay, so that's several, there's several things I should address. One is that those are actually, the three in a triangle is actually the same, essentially the same as three in a line. But it is true that there are different ways of making a two-hole torus a three-hole torus. There are many different ways of gluing them together. Uh, so to make a three-hole torus, wait, one way, no. So I misspoke here, I guess. The two by three is not the block for a two-hole torus. This is what changes. These are n and m. So the, for a two-hole torus, because we're cutting all the sides in half, it has to be even. So we just take the number of rows and number of columns and divide by two to get our n and m. So for a three-hole torus, what we do is instead of dividing into quadrants, we divide it into nine blocks. OK, thanks very much.